I've titled my discussion for this Sabbath morning, Being a Child of the Heavenly Father. How many of us grew up wanting to be just like either your father or your mother? We all do, don't we? For some of us, it's a challenge because our, our fathers are doing quite well in what they do. And for us to keep up with them, it's, it's quite difficult, isn't it? But we all want to become just like our father and our mothers. And for me especially, growing up, especially in an Adventist community, it, it, it's a big challenge. Because when people see me, they look at me and go, why is he nothing like his father? He speaks too much, he's too loud, he doesn't sit still in class. So my parents, so my teachers, most of them would wonder, is this really this man's son? Because he's out of control. And so that's something that I grew up with and that I struggled through. And so this morning I want to talk something, I want to talk to you about how do we become a child of our Heavenly Father. This is, a, this is a, my little girl. She's three months old now. If you look at this picture, what really differentiates us from the rest of you is our wonderful nose. It's really unique. It's really unique to the Moonsong family to have that little nose, and that's our unique identifier. Imagine if I have a kid and my kid doesn't have my nose, I would really be doubting <laughs> Where did this child come from? <laughs> so, do we look like our Father in Heaven? Do we act like our Father in Heaven? How are we behaving today? So, as Bible-believing Christians, we have a Heavenly Father. That's what the Bible teaches us, doesn't it? And I would like to bring your attention this morning to Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 48. And the interesting thing about the book of Matthew is it's written originally to the Jewish audience. Matthew wants to tell his Jewish community that Jesus is the Messiah that has been prophesied of and has come into fulfillment in the New Testament. So that is his goal. And he also wants to talk to, he also wants to convince his Jewish community that not only that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecy, but also how people in the kingdom of God will live like, or what do, how would they live like, or what will they look like, how will they act, how will they behave. And so if you look at this story in Matthew 5, chapter, chapter 5, 43 to 48, it is a, uh, it is situated at the beginning, uh, in, at the end of chapter 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount. It begins with, blessed are those. And in this teachings, Christ is actually teaching his people, or the, the listeners, the values and the ways of people who belong to the kingdom of God. And so this teaching on, we would like to focus especially on the teaching of Loving your enemies. How many of you have enemies? None of us do, right? Because we are really good Christians. <laughs> but, yeah, the teaching on loving your enemies is something that is really unique to Christianity. Islam may have a few verses in the Quran that says you should love... Uh, some, you should love one that is not a believer. Uh, Hindu, Hinduism may have some teachings, but in Christianity, this is really the essence of Christianity, isn't it? To love your enemies. And why do you think I can say that? The reason why I can say loving your enemies is a core Christian, Christian teaching is because not only did Jesus teach his disciples to love their enemies, but also he more than taught it. He lived it. And he even, even died on the cross 
for those that are his enemies. And that's why Christianity can say, we can claim that this is a unique teaching and a teaching that is specifically taught by Christianity, loving your enemies. So like the concept of loving one's enemies, one is, enemies is that one, it's, it's really against our human nature, isn't it? If someone, if someone says something bad about you, how do you respond? Do you go to their house and say thank you? Uh, bring them a you know, baked bread or a cake or something and say, can you please do it again? I don't think we do that, don't we? We can't do that. If someone hits us, we want to hit them back. If someone beeps us at the back of our car, what do we do? We want to <laughs> press, press on the horn right back. If someone overtakes you while you're driving, what do you do? You want to overtake them right back. That's why we have V6, V8 engines, right? We want those big machines so that we could outdo people. In, hu in our human nature, it's really against every bit of our human nature to love those that hate us and persecute us. So what does it mean to love your enemies? Especially those that will persecute you. And so I want us to read this first text in Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. It says, can we read it together? It says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, this is what was spoken by Jesus Christ himself. It is said, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Is there a verse in the Old Testament that says, Hate your enemy? Not really, right? So let's look at this. Love your neighbor and hate your enemies. So the command to love your neighbor is found in Leviticus 19 verse 18. But the command to hate your neighbor cannot be found anywhere else in the Old Testament. However, some teachers of the law, they would read into the text and they would interpret the, the command to love one's enemies or to love one's neighbor implied that if you are to love your neighbor, you should hate your enemies. So this is an implied teaching. It is not in the scripture. It is not taught in the Old Testament. It is an implied, uh, what you call, meaning by the teachers of the law. Something that they have added into the text. And also the Pharisees have also interpreted Levit Leviticus 19 verse 18 to teach that one is to love only those that loves in return. And so Jesus is now addressing this issue and saying, you have heard. He didn't say it was written. It is written in the scripture. But he said, you have heard that. You have heard that it, it, it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So in saying this, Christ wasn't saying you can hate your enemy, but rather you have heard because it wasn't written in the scriptures. So loving enemies and treating them well. What does it really reveal? What does it show? What we want to get to is for us personally to be able to come to this level of spiritual maturity where we have God, God is in control of our life. So if you are able to love your enemies, Treat them well. It shows that God is the Lord of your life. And only those who give their lives fully to God will be able to do it. And the Holy Spirit can help us. We know that. But the question is, are we able to do it? The concept here is, if you are able to let go, if you are able to let go of the control that you have over your heart, your thoughts and your mind, and give that control to God, you would be able to love your enemies and treat them well. It sounds very easy, right? And let's go to the next verse. 
In Matthew chapter 5, 44, it says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Again, this is really against human nature. But it says, Jesus is teaching, you and I should love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. And what does this mean? People who are children of God can be identified by two things. One, they will love their enemies. And secondly, they would be able to pray for those that persecute them. And if you look into the word love that's used in this text, it means to love in a social or moral sense those who are hostile towards us. It doesn't mean uh, loving them as, as if you would love your wife or your husband or the way you would love God, but in a social sense. And praying for them in, indicates making supplications to God, praying for them. And we'll continue to the next verse, which says, So that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So now, if you are thinking of how can I become a child of God, how to do it is by loving your enemies and praying for those that persecute you. That's what this text says. That's what Jesus is saying identifies who are children of the Father in heaven. If we are to look into our, into our hearts ourselves, can we identify or can God identify us as his children are we able to love our enemies of course right are we able to pray for those that persecute us that punishes us for something that we haven't done wrong yes we can God can help us do it so that's what Christ is teaching us here in Matthew 5:45. If you are a child of God, you should be able to love your enemies and pray for them. And that way, people will know you are a son or a daughter of the Heavenly Father. So what Jesus is saying is that he's not opposing to the Old Testament, the traditional law. He's saying there's no such thing as you should love something and hate something. Love your enemies, do good to those that hate you, and pray for them. And continuing on, so this is what identifies, this is what God does. So firstly, children of God will love their enemies and pray for them. And how does God show that he loves everyone equally the same? It says, God causes the sun to rise on those that are evil as well as those that are good. Do you think that is fair? Is it fair that God causes the sun to rise on those that are evil as well as those that are good? God causes the rain to fall on those that are good as well as that are not good. But that's the nature of God. And that's what God wants us to become. And if we read on, Matthew 46, 47, it says, For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your, brother, only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't, e don't even the Gentiles do the same. So Christ is challenging us here today. You know, if you only love those that love you, how are you different from people who are not believers of God? Is there any difference? Should there be any difference between a believer in God and an, and a non-believer? 
A person of faith, a person without faith. Because if you go outside, go into the malls, talk to anyone, they would agree that we should love those that love us, right? But if you ask them, should we love those that hate, hate us? Or should we love our enemies? What do you think their response would be? Of course not. So Christ is saying, if you love those who love you, how are you any different from the others? Even the tax collectors. We know what tax collectors are back then. They were treated or they were regarded as the rubbish of the society. They were, you know, the, the slaves or they were traitors of the Jewish people and they were trying to seek favor from the Roman. And so they were treated, treated as one of the lowest class of the society because they were regarded as traitors of the community. So even if the tax collectors are able to love their friends, how is that any different? from a believer and a non-believer because even the Gentiles do it. Is that a good question to ask ourselves today? Am I any better than someone that doesn't believe in God? Am I better than someone who has no moral foundation on biblical principles? Is there any difference in my life and theirs? So a believer is no different from a non-believer. It says, one only loves those who loves in return. Because even the tax collectors can do it. And one only greets his or her brothers and sisters. And the significance of this text is, in the Jewish community of the, during the times of Jesus Christ, Jewish people would just, you know, artif you know it's almost like going to Coles and the person at the counter says, uh, you know, hi, how are you? Right? And sometimes when you answer, they, sometimes it seems like they didn't hear what, 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 you just, what you have just responded. It's almost like very artificially are just asking, you know, how are you? And you go, oh, I'm not feeling too well and do you think they will have time to listen? Not really, right? See, what Christ is saying is that Jewish people in those times, they would just greet people for the sake of peace, not really because they care. And so Jesus is saying that our actions shouldn't be artificial, something that's just on the top, but something that has to be deeper that comes from the heart, that when you, when you see someone come to church, you shake their hand in front, you know, right at the door, you ask them, you know, happy Sabbath, how are you? You really mean what you say. Because you never know what that person coming through your church would have experienced before coming, coming into your door. So caring about people, loving people, even though you don't know them, even though they may be your enemies, that's what that's the level of spiritual maturity God wants us to reach and become. In Matthew 5, 48, the last text, it says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. As Christians, can we actually be perfect? Perfection is a word that is really something not, that we really don't want to really talk about, don't we? How do I know Rodell is a perfect member of Frankston Church? How do we, you know, what, what do we, how do we measure perfection? Be perfect, it says. Perfection in character. We should be perfect like God in character. Although we cannot be without sin, we will all have our shortcomings, we will all have our flaws, but a believer is to aspire to be like Christ, to be like God in character. We shouldn't be happy that, we, you know, as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, 
I shouldn't just be happy. I shouldn't just be happy just because I don't smoke and drink, right? Because God demands perfection. As in, when you first become a Christian, you leave your old life. You stop drinking. You stop smoking. You stop doing things that you used to do. But then, are there more things you have to develop as a person, not just? That not doing things, because, for example, a Christian, a man who was drunk, he was uh, he was partying, he was doing drugs, he becomes a Christian, he leaves all those and comes to church, but now, all these drugs and alcohol and all these drinks, he has left away. But what is left to improve? The heart, right? We should seek more to be more patient. We should try harder, or we should try to be kind. We should try to be understanding, loving, because that's what God wants us to become, more and more like Him in character. And if we look at Christ and if we aspire to be like Him, we can de- develop this character. As a child, as a young person growing up, uh, you know how many of you follow football or soccer? In the Philippines, there's、uh, basketball. All my friends play basketball, but me, coming from Burma, I love soccer. And、uh, during 1998, 1999, Manchester were the red hot thing. They were really famous. The whole squad shaved their head. And so, what do you think I did? Because I wanted to be like David Beckham. I I don't know if I do look like him now. <laughs> but, but you know, because you want to be like David Beckham, you begin shaving your head. You begin to wear that Vodafone、uh, soccer jersey, and you begin to follow whatever hairstyle he has. But the funny thing is, I'm completely Asian, and he's completely Caucasian. So I look nothing like him, but I feel like him because I had shaved my head. And until today, I'm still shaving my head. Beckham doesn't do it anymore. But see, if there is something that you aspire to become, not David Beckham, or you know Johnny Depp or any other actor or actresses, but if you actually aspire to become like Christ in character and heart, it is possible. Look at what's happening with、uh, with a lot of young people. If you go outside, they would watch MTVs and they would watch、uh, you know MTV News. And they would see this rapper or this singer dressing this way, that way, speaking this way, that way, and what do you think they do? They want to speak that way. Be perfect in character doesn't mean you have to be totally sinless, but you have to desire most of all to be like Christ. Aspire to be like Christ in character. And secondly. Aspire to be like Christ in holiness. A person that has been saved. Many people ask me, you know, you Seventh Day Adventist,、uh, do you keep the Sabbath because you want to be saved? Do you not eat pork because you want to be saved? And I said, you got the picture totally wrong. I don't keep the Sabbath. I don't eat this. I don't eat this. Not because I want to be saved, but because I am already saved. Why would a person that has been saved, that has been cleansed by the blood of God, want to go back and be dirty? There will be times in our life when we fail, when we fall. But we have Christ, who says, "Come to me. I will wash you clean. I will, you know, take my robe of righteousness." Depend on me. If we depend on Christ, if we aspire to be holy like Christ, we can be holy and be perfect in maturity. How would you like to see a 50-year-old man acting like a seven-year-old kid? He goes to Coles and wants everything. He wants all the cereals and Milo, you know, Milo, Milo cereals and all that, all those Ovaltine and all those little kiddies drinks and stuff. That would be strange, isn't it? We need to grow spiritually. We need to grow into maturity as well. 
if a one-year-old, if if a one-year-old can speak and act and behave like a ten-year-old, would something be wrong with the kid? Definitely, right? It ha- it would be strange. And be perfect in love. Our human nature, if we depend on our human nature, we can never be perfect in love. This morning we also discussed about love, and someone read First Corinthians chapter thirteen, which describes what a person that is loving would be would behave like. But if we look to Christ, if we aspire to be like Him, yes, we can be perfect in our love as well. If you look at this chart, you know, after eight years of marriage, finally got a little girl in our life, and it, and it changed everything. Uh, lots of you know sleepless nights, lots of noise in the house, but it's interesting. If you look at this, it's saying that from zero to one month, it will act that way. They can you know get on their tummy. From one to two, they can start doing that, and two to three, three to four. My baby girl is three to four, so she is doing those things. But imagine if a newborn child can start walking. That would be strange, isn't it? That wouldn't be fur- perfect. It would be weird. <laughs> oh, what if a twelve-month-old kid acts like? A one-month-old kid. Something's wrong, right? See, we are not asking babies to be able to preach right away as soon as they are born, but what we are expecting from babies is that they would grow accordingly to their age. And that's what God is actually speaking about here when he, when Christ was talking about perfection. He's not saying. When you get baptized, when you accept me as your Lord and Savior, you should be a hundred percent perfect. No more sin, no more anger. You should be like the Buddha, who is always at peace and calm and quiet. That's not what God is asking of us. He's just saying, as a Christian, you need to be perfect in character, in holiness, maturity, and in love. According to your age, or your age, your spiritual age. So, if a baby uh, who is a six-month-old, you know, she begins sitting. Seven, they begin to reach. They, uh, at the uh, eight months, they begin standing, and nine, they begin to walk on fours. And you know, these are the stages of development for children. We need to look at our spiritual development. Are we growing? Are you a Christian for the past thirty years and there is no spiritual development in you? That is a cause for concern, isn't it? But if you're growing daily in Christ, yes, you can claim to be perfect in Christ, because what because of what Christ has done for you and myself. So Christ is challenging, challenging us to be perfect, just as He is perfect. So Christ expects a high standard of morality and genuineness from His followers. He is not looking for artificial Christians who is just acting from, you know, the, the surface. He is actually wanting us to grow into Christians who are acting from the heart, people that are genuinely loving, and caring, and kind. Believers are to live with, incor- with believers are to live lives that incorporates genuine love for those who are hostile towards them, and to pray for them that oppress them. So Christ will not have his followers behaving as those who do not know God, because the Bible says, "For those that know God, who is what is God?" It says, "God is love." And therefore, we are to be loving people. 
And God's spiritual children are to grow to resemble the perfection of the Heavenly Father. And I want to leave you with this thought. John 13 verse 35 says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. For many people, if you are a non-believer and you are here in this church today and you're listening to this text and you go, this is really nuts because it's not logical. It doesn't make sense, does it, to love people that hate you? It doesn't. And you know what the Bible says? The wisdom of God, people who are not believers will look at the wisdom of God and they will laugh at it, they will mock it. Because it really goes against everything that they, they believe in or that they stand for. So this is two very, we are living in a world with two very different worldviews that is separating from one another. Over on the right, you have values and morals of the people of the Heavenly Father. People that belong to the Kingdom of God. And over here, you have people that belong to this world. Our values will never match. To them, you will look like a fool. And to you, they may look like a fool because your values are becoming more and more distant as the centuries go on. And that's reality. So for a non-believer to love your enemy would be something that is just illogical. We were in our youth Sabbath school and I asked the young people, do you think this makes sense? Love your enemies and pray for them. There was one young, pe one, one young man, he raised his hand and said, this is totally nuts, he said. This is crazy. Why would I love someone that hate me? Why would I pray for someone that, why would I be, why would I treat the person that hates me very well? Because the more I will get from that person is more hate and more opposition. And they will trample on my head and they will beat me down they will bully me even more and I would be hurt. So we went on discussing and in the end I said, how, where would you choose to live? Would you choose to live in a community that loves each other? Even though they may be enemies at some point in time, they would still love each other and they would still pray for each other. Or would you love to be a part of a community group? When you become friends, you love each other. But when you become enemies, you hate each other and you begin to fight each other. Which would you choose? And of course, all the young people says we would choose people that are loving, forgiving, loving even towards their enemies and praying for them. And see, what we are trying to do coming to church every Sabbath is trying to become children of God, aren't we? We want to be like God. We want to create a community because Christ said that the kingdom of God is already here. And it is here if we choose to live that way. If you choose to let go of our pettiness and our selfish desires and start letting, giving the control to God, the kingdom of God is already here. And the kingdom of God is already here when we love even our enemies. Even when we pray for those that persecute us, the kingdom of God is here, can be here, if we accept it in our lives. Imagine a church like Frankston, where even enemies are loved and prayed for, who wouldn't want to belong to this kind of church? I definitely would. And that is what Christ is teaching us. He's teaching us the values and morals of the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of this world, because the views are totally different. But we can make this choice as believers. We can trust in what the Bible has said. 
we can hold on to the teachings of Christ and we can make the kingdom of, hap- the kingdom of God be established right here in this church starting from our hearts. And that's the thought I want to leave with you today. May God bless you, strengthen you as you desire Jesus more than anything else in this world. Thank you. That's so powerful prayer. Father, we just read a scripture that just goes contrary to what the world believes in. The world may think we are fools, but Father, by faith we believe in your word and that the community and our lives will be much better when we love, when we have love in our hearts, a love that even encompasses love for enemies and supplications for our enemies. Father, may your kingdom be established starting from our hearts to our families, to the communities and to the church. And Father, may by the love of the church of Frankston, may the people around us know us as children of the Heavenly Father. We thank you for your love and help us, Father, to love each day. May you bless us as we leave this house of prayer and worship. All these things, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.